My name is Pete G. Flores. I was born and raised here in El Paso. I was uh, born and raised in one of the, uh, probably the poorest sections of the city way back in uh, 1932 during Prohibition and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and of course uh, the, the, the economic area at the time was very rough. And uh, I went to one of the local schools here in El Paso, the Bowie High School, which is very well known still at this time. And uh, I graduated in 1950. But throughout my school career, I went into graphics. I've always liked to draw. So consequently, I became a commercial artist after that. But it didn't last long because when I got out of school in 1950, I volunteered to go to, uh, to Korea because at the time, the Korean War had just started, if you recall. It started way back in 1951, I think. So uh, I joined the service. But, and uh, after my basic training, which was in San Antonio, uh, I came home and got married. And I've been married for 63 years. So uh, that started my uh, military career, so to speak, and, uh, and my basic training. And then, and then, of course, my schooling and everything else. But one of the things that I'd like to mention is that I went to a school where... Uh, Way back in Second World War, there was Company E in El Paso, and some of those were some of my either relatives or friends. Uh, during the Second World War, they were in the, uh, in the invasion of the Rapido River in the, uh, Italy, and most of my friends and somebody else's friends locally got wiped out in that area. So that kids that, uh, after I got through with school, that encouraged me to, to join the service uh, because of the Korean War. And I did. You enlisted. What, when was that? I enlisted in March of uh, 1951. And I took basic training in San Antonio, Lakeland Air Force Base in San Antonio. And there were so many of us that uh, for the first three weeks of my basic training, we were in tents with our civilian clothes on because everybody was volunteering. And it appeared to me like uh, it was just a... a Tremendous amount of people from way, way back from California all the way down to El Paso and uh, to San Antonio. The, uh, the uh, train which uh, was transporting us to San Antonio was just picking up people all over. And uh, when we got there, uh, we were assigned to uh, tents because there was no room in the barracks. And that's where I had my uh, basic training. So why were so many people enlisting? I guess uh, I guess because they wanted to, uh, and simply because there was a war effort, and everybody wanted to pitch into the war effort, like myself. Uh, even though I had some good friends in school, uh, in fact, I enlisted with two of my closest friends in school. All three of us went out there and and raised our hand and signed up, and two days later we were gone, or on our way to uh, to uh, San Antonio. So how much? How much did you know about the war? How, how common was it to hear about it in the news? Well, it, it was all over, of course, in the news. There's no doubt about that. But uh, we didn't really know that much about the war. Uh, we, were still, we were still remembering the Second World War because the war had just ended, you know, way back in 48 and 49. There were still elements of, uh, of that type of feeling in the, in the Second World War. But when the Korean War started, I would imagine that because of that, because of that feeling, uh, we felt, hey, it's our turn to go, and uh, and we did. And not only myself, but a number of friends of mine. We all raised our hands, like I said, and there we go. But we wanted to. So had you finished high school at that point? Oh, yes. Well, I had already finished high school. In fact, I had just gotten out of high school not long before that. Um, uh, my uh, future wife was, uh, and, and myself graduated the same day uh, uh, from different schools. And, uh, and then after that, uh, when I finished my basic training and they sent me to, uh, to school in the Air Force, as I joined the Air Force, um, then I decided uh, we'll, we'll get married, and, and I did. We got married in uh, December the 27th, way back when. 63 years ago. Of uh, 51? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, 51. Yeah. It's been so long, I can't remember all that, you know. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep the timeline straight in my mind. Yeah. Graduating and listening. You know. Right, yeah. 
and, uh, and and of course, basic training didn't last more than 12 weeks or 14 weeks or something like that. And uh, at that point, they sent me to uh, photo training in Denver, Colorado, Lower Air Force Base in Denver. And I stayed there for about three or four months, I think it was, uh, of, uh, of uh, photo training and camera repair work also. I was included in my, in, in my service career. After that, when I got out of there, uh, they uh, sent me to Topeka, Kansas, Air Base in Topeka, Kansas, as a, um, I guess, only job training type of thing. And then from there, uh, after I spent, I think, about four or five months there, well, not even that long, maybe about three months, they sent me to, uh, they sent me to the 376 Bomb Wing in um, Barksdale Air, Air Force Base in uh, Bossier City, Louisiana, which is across the across the uh, river from uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, and that's where uh, it all started. Since I wasn't married, I was already married. I couldn't I couldn't uh, go to the mess hall because I was getting a a few dollars at the end of the month as a subsistence for for being married and living outside the base, and. Um, my friends and I, and I remember one of them that went with me to uh, Korea, uh, we used to play poker at noon, just to pass the time away in our lunchtime. And uh, after I was there for, oh, I don't know, maybe six months or so, uh, I don't recall, uh, uh, a surgeon comes in, as we were playing poker, a surgeon comes in and says, who wants to volunteer with Flores to go to Japan? <laughs> I was, He needed two guys, and I was one of them. So a friend of mine uh, by the name of Bill Hunter uh, says, I'll go with you. And uh, and we came back. Uh, they gave me a 10-day leave. And, you know, I want to tell you a little funny story. When uh, we were living outside the base, my wife started painting the kitchen that morning. And he said, well, by the time I get out of work, I'll come over and help you fix up and clean up and all that. You'll almost be through because it was a small kitchen. But I came home at noon because the sergeant says, I asked him when, and he says, right now. So I came home and my wife was still painting the kitchen. <laughs> and I told him, stop, I says, why, we're leaving, when, tonight. And so we threw all our stuff in, there, all, all five pounds of our stuff that we had, and got in our car and came back to El Paso, and I had a 10-day leave. And uh, I stayed there three days, and I got a telegram, report to Ken Stoneman immediately. They had already lost a photographer out there or something, I guess, I don't know. But anyway, I got, I got on the train because there was no planes at that time. We were used to use the railroad, and I went all the way down to California. It took about a day and a half or two days to get to Kent Stoneman. And, and the, funny, the funny part about this, and I'd like to mention it, is that I got there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon to Kent Stoneman, and I met some of my friends that had been there, what, almost 30 days waiting for shipment to Japan. And I was in, the, in a transoceanic flight at 6 o'clock that same day. We landed in Hawaii, then Wake Island, then Japan. We got to Japan about the second day, around midnight. And it appeared like they were waiting for me because there was a sergeant there and I introduced myself. I was already a sergeant myself. And he says, get your duffel bag. We're, we're on our way. So they threw me... In a, in a C-3 plane, that a transport plane, uh, full of duffel bags, and they flew me to Okinawa. And that was my initial trip to Okinawa. And after, after 11 months, I came back from the same island. But it was a fun part during that, that period of time. So once you were in Okinawa... Then what, what I was, did your first assignment look like? I was assigned to the photo lab at the time, and uh, it kind of familiarized myself before I went into the installation of the planes and, uh, and, and, and going into the B-29s and things like that, because the 376 bomb wing was there. And uh, to me, it was very rather unusual, because I'd never been in a, in a combat zone area, sort of, sort of thing. Uh, and um, the planes were very different, in my estimation. One was park here and the other one was parked a half a mile away, the other was parked. They were all separate, so we had to run around from one plane to the other. And as a rule, uh, out of 40 or 60 planes that would fly, there would be three photo planes in the group. 
and we used to install the cameras and I would get in there and, and take pictures and stuff like that. But uh, it was a, it was an experience. Uh, but you know, being young and dumb and in gun ho and all that sort of thing, you, you don't really mind the experience. One of the things that I do recall is when the, our squadron would leave and I didn't go, we had to stay there and wait until the planes got back. We had to stay in the, in the, in the shed out there in the runway. So we could wait for the planes to come back so we could remove the film so we could analyze it and stuff because all the, the three photo planes had a number of cameras, not just one camera. They had the whole series of uh, what they call the K series of cameras. And then all the gun turrets had a 60 millimeter movie camera. So we would take them off and uh, put them in a box and take them to the photo lab and then they would process them. And, and by the time they post flight, the film was already processed and ready to go the next time. So what does the military use those pictures for? Well, I would say that uh, an analysis of where the bumps dropped and whether they hit the target or not or what to hit next. Uh, but one of the unusual things that I do recall is that in one area of Korea, and I don't recall exactly which one, uh, what the, the area was, all three flights were hitting them at the same time from uh, Clark Air Force Base, maybe 30, 40 planes. And as soon as they left the area, the 376 one wing from uh, Okinawa, another 40, 60 planes. And by the time we left the area, which was around, oh, maybe four o'clock in the morning, then another flight from Jap to Chikawa, Japan, right in the same area. Because I remember the photos of how much damage there was in that same area. Were you on any of those flights or you were processing? No, no, I would process the film and analyze it and or or help them analyze it. Uh, I, I wasn't an expert on that. Uh, my, I, my duties were to set up the cameras and take the pictures and then let somebody else do the analysis. But it was interesting, uh, you know, like again, like I say, I had always wanted to be a photographer and, a, and an artist, so that, that combination, and I asked for it. When I joined the service, I asked for photography, and, and they gave it to me. So I was one of the lucky ones, I guess. So it was something you were interested in even before? Oh, yes. Like high school? And yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Even in high school, I used to take pictures with a little C3 camera that I had, and, uh, and, and of course, I did a lot of artwork in, in high school. I was one of the lucky ones in high school also, and that... Uh, that I used to uh, do a lot of artwork in school. Uh, all my book reports, I would read the book and then illustrate it instead of write a story. <laughs> give, give it to the teacher. And uh, in 1950, when I graduated, um, in 1950, uh, they dedicated the yearbook to me because of my artwork in school. So I was pretty lucky. Uh, and and I, ever since then, I've been in, in the graphics or publications. Can you tell me about some of the missions that you flew on? Um, one of the things that I remember is uh, is the uh, the pre flights and stuff. And uh, I was a guest in the plane. Okay, I wasn't a member of a crew uh, because I had to install cameras in different planes, and you never know where you landed. So I was a guest, and they would assign a guy to guide me in case something happened. I'd be the first one at the at the door, so to speak. But other than that, it was just boring. It was. Uh, in that area, in that height, you don't take pictures by looking through a side. You preset the camera, and then the bombardier tells you, okay, five degrees on, so, and they tilt the cameras, and then, um, and then they say, okay. Every plane used to have what they call two 500-pound J, J blue bombs, so phosphorus bombs, and they would drop the bombs, and it would light up the entire area. And the photo cells and the camera would start working. Would start working immediately, and uh, and after that, um, after that, the pictures because they were roll films, big rolls, nine inch wide and five hundred feet long, I guess. And then come back home and throw the film out the window, and and by the time we got off the plane, it was being processed already. And that was an experience in that. Um, it was it was not an easy ride. It was not an easy uh, uh, time, which which to me, and I, again I'm one of the lucky ones because I was not in the in the land area of Korea. I didn't want I didn't go through the suffering that a lot of my friends did. 
uh, a lot of the hardships that they passed through and a lot of the the, the uh, battles that they fought. I was too far away and, uh, and too high up in the air, I guess you would say. But uh, again, it's, it's all part of the combat. What kind of cameras did you use? We use um, what they call a, a, a K-series camera. So there were about eight inch uh, lenses in the cameras. And uh, the plants carried three sizes. They carried a, uh, a 20 photo, um, photo length, a 28 photo length, and a 34 photo length. That was actually three big cameras that would stick out to the, the base of the uh, airplane. And then uh, in my case, I would carry a uh, shoulder K-17 camera strapped to my chest with uh, handles. It would go like this. And it was a roll film also. And um, and then in the base, uh, I, I was allowed to carry a uh, an Argus C3, a little little bitty camera. I was a, uh, as a photographer, I was allowed to carry a, a camera on base, and uh, and I used to snap out a couple of pictures here and there and stuff like that, but nothing exciting because there was really nothing exciting happening there. Uh, so it was all airplanes and and uh, some sheds out there where we used to keep the cameras. We used to keep the cameras in, a, in a, like a warehouse type and then transport them to the set, preset them and then install them in the planes and, and then from there they would go. One of the things that I remember about the island uh, of Okinawa is that there was no place to go. We couldn't go anywhere. There was no, uh, there was a small village right at the exit of the, uh, the base but there was the only area that we could, that could go outside the base and walk around about three or four block area like a little, uh, I guess, Korean village, if you like. And uh, and in the base, we only had one little restaurant and uh, in a bar called a Snake Pit. I remember that because I recall going out the door without the benefit of opening that door <laughs> a couple of times. But anyway, we wanted to go anywhere because this was Kadena, the Kadena Air Force Base. If we wanted to go anywhere, they would transport us in a bus to Naha, which was a theater there in the, in the PX and things like that. And then they would wait for us and then they would bring us back to Naha. So that was our exciting uh, weekend, sometimes when we had a weekend, because most of the time we were on duty. We were there and, uh, and a lot of times we just had to spend it out there in the flight, flight path, sometimes waiting for the planes to come back and or sometimes, you know, just doing regular duties that we had to do. Do you have any uh, specific stories that you remember, or you know, any stories that stand out from the missions that you flew when you were taking pictures? One of the things that, uh, not in the mission itself, but in the um, in the island itself, when uh, we encountered a very bad storm one time. Uh, there used to be some small storms, uh, I guess hurricanes or cyclones, whatever you call them at the time. And because of the, uh, there were so many planes, there was a lot of B-29 planes. Uh, they used to fly, and they, they, the crews would get in the planes, and they used to fly them in the ground until the storm passed. Sometimes for uh, hours they would run, run on the ground and with the motors running and stuff. That was scary because you don't know whether the plane was going to take off or, or turn around or whatever. But other times, and I recall two very, very strong, uh, what would you call it, a hurricane or a cyclone at, the, at there, they fly, fl flew all the planes out of the island. And it lasted for about three days. And uh, they, we had uh, big barracks. Uh, they, we had... Uh, brick and mortar barracks, they weren't tents, they were big buildings. And they all, they gave us all a little box of uh, rations for three days and locked us in the rooms and, until the storm passed. That was scary. More scary than flying a B-29 because you're 30,000 feet up in the air, you don't know what's happening. <laughs> but other than that, uh, not, nothing unusual happened uh, aside from the war effort. Uh, in my case, I don't have any uh, heroic stories to tell because it was it was just routine, so to speak. Can you kind of paint a picture for me? What did it look like when you were in the airplane and you were looking down at the bombing or whatever? You couldn't see anything. There was nothing. There was, uh, it was at night. There was 14, there was 12-hour flights. 
There, there was nothing to see. One of the things that uh, that you had to be careful was tilting the cameras to the right, the right degree. Other than that, it was just a right, uh, uh, and not like a commercial flight either. <laughs> but um, again, it was it was kind of routine. It was other photographers. There was um, in our group there was uh, four photographers and uh, maybe about six maintenance people. And we all pitched in to uh, to install the cameras in the planes, uh, remove the cameras from the plane because every 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 group of planes had at least three photo planes, and they were fully equipped with cameras all over. And of course, all the other planes had um, gun carried uh, gun turret cameras, uh, six millimeter little cameras that looked like a little uh, little box of cigarettes, so to speak, little. They were all inserted in the uh, gun turrets, and uh, we had to install them, and we had to remove them, we had to analyze them, and get the film and send it to the photo lab. What happened at that point, I don't know, but uh, in many cases, and I will mention this, um, when an airplane or a group of airplanes would miss a target, and they came back, and by the time we unloaded, the film was already processed, they would call it a NORA mission. They had to go back. If 10 planes missed the target, all those 10 planes were reloaded again, had to go back. Another 14 hours, 30, 12 hours, because they missed their mission, they missed their target area. That I remember, but other than that, it was just routine day and night, day and night, and with very little rest. In the, in the 11 months that I spent there, I don't think that we, I went to the movies maybe once or twice, and uh, and being a barracks chief also because that's what I was a sergeant there at the time. Uh, it was demanded in that you had to keep track of all these dummies that were there at the time with us. But uh, nothing exciting really. Where were you when the war actually ended? I was still in the island, and I think the the war ended in June of. Um, the 23rd of June or 27th of June in 53. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we were still in the island. And, and, and during that period of negotiations, we, uh, we got ready to, to come back home. And, and, um, and it lasted for days. And all of a sudden, it appeared like everything else started all over again. We had to unload and repack and reload the planes and uh, the mess. And then we waited. And then we did it all over again, unloaded and packaged, and then got ready to come home. But um, I was still in the island when the war ended, or when they were in the, in the process of armistice or whatever. Because, you know, Korea is still at war, so to speak. We are technically uh, still at war with, the, uh, with North Korea. But um, my service career there ended and, uh, in June and haven't gone back since. We have no desire to go back since. Uh, I do have a, 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 my brother, my son-in-law, um, uh, Tim Grant. Uh, he works for Raytheon, and he is a um, some some kind of electronic expert. So they send him all over, and they send him to Okinawa, and he sent me photos of Okinawa through the in, in a computer. He said, "You see that this is different now, different from pictures that I remember." <laughs> pictures that I have in my album uh, of the, uh, the planes and stuff. And uh, he said, this is different. Now there's hotels, there's shopping centers and all that. <laughs> of course, after so many years, what, 60 years or so? Yeah, but he makes fun of me. He says, uh, but um, and right now, in fact, he's in uh, Dubai or someplace, you know, somewhere out there. He doesn't tell me where he's going. <laughs> but that's it's interesting in that... Uh, you know, you're there 60 years ago. It was just an island in the time of war, so to speak. And all of a sudden, here you have reference 60 years later of a striving economy in the island and the shopping centers and movie theaters and, and supermarkets and all this stuff. You, you can hardly believe that. But it happened in Korea, it happened in South Korea. We have the Korean Reborn uh, publication and. Um, it shows everything that uh, 
my friends did. Again, I want to emphasize that uh, I guess I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't go through those hardships. I see that book and I said, Jay, and I do have friends. I lost friends there. Uh, I, I see them and they, they suffered through it. And uh, um, my friend Jerry, he was a prisoner of war and uh, so was uh, Shissom and, and all those other friends. Uh, but, um, but I was safe, so to speak, in, in terms of the war effort. I was safe as compared to them. So I admire them for their service also. You know. What but, kind of friendships and camaraderie did you build? You know, uh, surprisingly, I only had one good friend, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Bill Hunter. He was from New York. And he was very close to me because we went to, uh, to BASIC together. And uh, we went to uh, Japan together, as a matter of fact. He was the one that volunteered. But other than that, uh, I didn't really have that many friends. I was the, the uh, what they call the barracks chief out there, I guess. And, um, and it was rough in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, when you have a number of uh, soldiers or airmen or whatever, uh, there's always some conflict. So there was always a problem somewhere, someplace. And then, of course, your job that was very demanding. Uh, to me, it was, uh, I don't know, it was a little... It was fun because we were young, but it was also very demanding at times. So. But uh, as far as close friendships, uh, I only remember Bill, Bill Hunter. And, uh, and you know, throughout the years I tried to contact him, but I could never contact him. But uh, other than that, you know, and, and then when the time came to, to come back, um, I came back in the USS uh, Breckenridge. It was a troop carrier plane, and... Um, we spent uh, from Okinawa. This we went to um, to Japan to Tichikawa, Japan, and stayed there about two weeks or three weeks, and then all the way to San Francisco. Took 18 days, actually 22 days, to cross the ocean to San Francisco. We arrived in San Francisco about four o'clock in the afternoon, and again, you know, the 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 Korean War is is basically forgotten. You know. Uh, and one of the reasons, that I'm a member of uh, two organizations, uh, veteran organizations, the Veterans Business Association and the Veterans Resource Center. In fact, I'm the chair of one of them. But the, uh, the, the idea is that every time we attend a seminar or attend a meeting or something, in a very, somebody always says, well, Second World War, you know, and then of course Vietnam, they, they miss Korea. And I always speak up and I say, hey, look, I'm a Korean War veteran. And uh, when we arrived in San Francisco, there was nothing, just like the Vietnam people. Uh, there was no bands, there was no uh, no dancing girls, no no drummers, nothing, uh, no flex flying. It was just a big warehouse. And uh, when the ship arrived, uh, we all got in line. And uh, I do recall that they had uh, a series of windows in alphabetical order, and uh, since I was florist, I went into the F window and, and checked out, and they would pay you all your money, and you only wait till your next assignment. That's the way it turned out. You know, again, a lot of uh, my friends, and I, who, I have a lot of friends of mine that, uh, that are members of our organization that are uh, Vietnam veterans, and even the present conflicts. And they're always uh, complaining about, well, we, we didn't get any flex flying or any dancing girls either, you know, or popcorn or coffee, nothing. Well, we didn't either. Korean veterans didn't either. So that's that was the results of our our service. Uh, we I served for 11 months uh, and 10 days. I think it was 11 months and 10 days, and then came back. And then they assigned me to Gary Air Force Base. And because there was no planes there, there wasn't an air. Uh, it was a uh, Air Force uh, tra training camp for ROTC people. They assigned me to as, um, and this is funny, they assigned me to the police department downtown as a photographer. So I used to carry my camera and report to the police department instead of the base. And I covered the area south of uh, to San Antonio, north to Austin. That, that was my beat as a ground photographer because there was no, uh, no airplanes there, other than uh, helicopters, and which I was assigned to either one of three helicopters, and, uh, and I was discharged after that. 
You said you served for 11 months. Was that 11 months in Okinawa? Or in Okinawa. In no, 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 no. In Okinawa, before I came back. Before my duty assignment in Okinawa was 11 months and 9 days. I know because I counted them. <laughs> and then, of course, we went to Japan waiting for shipment. And then, of course, uh, the USS Breckenridge brought us back to San Francisco. What was your date of arrival back in San Francisco? It was, um, if I recall, it was June. It was in June of 1953. The war had just ended. You know, the war ended in June of 50, uh, 27th of June of 1953. And it was right after the, and I recall when they were evidently negotiating or something or whatever armistice they went through, we were told to pack all our cameras, all our equipment, and we did. We started packing everything in big boxes and stuff. And uh, about two weeks later, and I don't know whether the negotiating went good or bad, we had to unpack everything all over again and reinstall them in the planes. And then they stayed there for a few days and then we took them out again and and they came home. But there was uh, an incident there where uh, where they told us to pack everything and we did and then all of a sudden we had to unpack real fast. And and, uh, and after that, uh, it was just a matter of days before uh, I, I returned home. But anyway, uh, it was, uh, it was an, uh, being a sergeant, at the time staff sergeant, I didn't have any duties in the USS Breckenridge. A lot of my friends had had to do a lot of cleaning up, so I played poker all throughout this 18, this 18 almost 22 days before I arrived to San Francisco, played poker and stuff. And uh, when we arrived, my wife was waiting for me in California. We have relatives in California, so she was there waiting for me. And um, and we bought a car in California. We bought a car and drove it all the way to El Paso. Instead, spent a few days here in El Paso and then reported to Carrier Force Base. And for my last um, nine months or eight, ten months of service. And then I was discharged. I was discharged the, uh, the 5th of March in 1955. I didn't want to stay any longer. After like four years is enough. So I came back and I opened up my own business. I was a sign painter then and I, do, I was doing commercial art. I was designing menus for restaurants <laughs> in my drawing table, in my kitchen table. And that's how it all started. And uh, I attended, uh, I was very lucky also again because of my artwork. Philco saw my artwork. Philco. Uh, and Philco had a contract with NASA, and they needed artists. And you know, at the time, and I'll mention this because it's important, 65 to $70 a month was a lot of good money. You know, we're, we're talking way back in early 50s. So consequently, when, uh, when I had a good day or a good week, uh, I would every $70, that was great. Uh, we had a nice home. I bought my home during the uh, GI Bill. And um, and then Philco found out that I was uh, I was an artist because uh, they checked my school record. So they called me in one evening. Uh, some representative, I remember them, a gentleman, Mr. Sexton from Houston, here in El Paso, and and offered me a job. And he offered me a hundred and two dollars a week. That was a lot. Of, I it took me about two seconds to uh, to decide, and I did. And that started my whole school schooling because Philco paid for my college education. They sent me to California, in fact, my whole family. They sent me to California, they bought us a home, to, at least they set up the, the home for us. And, uh, and I attended San Francisco Art Institute and, uh, and completed there. And then I attended uh, San Jose State for journalism and uh, creative writing. Because I've written four books so far and uh, so this started my career in, in graphics as in a professional level because I was an illustrator for NASA. And one of the proudest moments, of course, in my, in my career was seeing my illustrations in national magazines. You know, that, that was a feather in my cap, so to speak. 
And uh, I worked with them until my contract expired, and uh, and then we decided to come back home. And it was way back in 1972. And because I had been an illustrator, uh, it was easy for me to blend into the commercial business here in El Paso. But I found a need for mapping for the city. The city was growing quite a bit. And I started publishing the Street Locator Guide for the city, and it turned out tremendously well. And uh, and then the city started doing a lot of the mapping with me and uh, a lot of the service industry, uh, UPS, uh, FedEx, and all those service industries. Tried and re- st- I started designing road maps for them. So I was in business for about 28 years in the map business. And then I decided, and, and then a company from, from Dallas uh, bought the rights to one of my publications, and I retired in 2002, I think it was. And I've been doing very little since. Aside from what I like to do, I like to play a little golf, and I like to do a little bit of woodwork and stuff. But that my my, the, my whole cycle of my career was all based on my service career, I guess, uh, so to speak, you know. How did your time in the service uh, affect what you did for the rest of your life? I think that... Uh, it, 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 it kind of uh, gave, gave me the incentive to, to continue forward in terms of uh, this is what I want to do. Uh, I was very lucky in that I asked for photography. The government gave me a photography. They sent me to school. This is one thing that I wanted to do because I had been doing some of it in high school to start with. <coughs> and, then, uh, and then following up in the service with a career that I really wanted and asked for in God, that was, that was tremendous. So consequently, when I got out of the service, uh, it all fell in place. Now, not only photography, but graphic art. And, uh, and um, when, uh, when I opened up my shop here, I was doing a lot of uh, little drawings for manual designs and things like that. And, and it appeared to me like that particular work that I did, somebody saw it. Mr. Sexton saw it, I know, from Houston. He liked it, he hired me, and that started my whole function in the publication and, uh, and, and graphic business. As an illustrator for NASA for nine years, it's uh, quite, a, quite a jump from high school right to, to illustrate. And then uh, with Raytheon, I started teaching um, uh, airbrush renderings and stuff like that. So uh, my entire career in business has been in the graphics and publication field. And my sons are in there right now. What do you think of the U.S.-Korea relations today? You know, um, it shouldn't be like this. I think we could have done something a long time ago. The fact that we had lasted this long, that we have uh, waited this long, we had allowed North Korea to do things that they shouldn't have done 20 years ago, 25 years ago, so to speak. But it's too late now. The beauty of it is that North South Korea, rather, has grown tremendously. It's one of the uh, the, the largest industrial complexes in, in in the world, I would think now. So we're doing fine in our side, but we're not fine on the other side. Things could happen any minute. I might get my telefo- my uniform out of the closet, you know, and get ready. Who knows? I might call everybody. But anyway, uh, not being facetious. Uh, uh, it's a it's a struggle, yet South Korea has really economically developed itself into a into a world nation, and uh, and we don't know how North Korea is doing. But sooner or later, the pot's going to boil. I think sooner or later something's going to pop out, hopefully for the better. But again, um, we're in that a, we're in that uh, level where we don't know whether to balance to the right or balance to the left. So we keep an eye on them. Like, uh, and you know, we have the, the militarized zone, which is 250 miles long and two miles wide. Somebody's got to keep an eye on that, and that's what we're doing. And I have friends out there right now, or not, not family members, but some friends that are, that are out there right now, have been in the service, career, career soldiers that, that are out there. But uh, in, in this particular case, hopefully uh, things are materialized to the point where something will be settled, because it's not settled yet. 
We'll see. How do you feel like your time in the military has affected your attitude towards military and war? You know, I had two brothers in the service. I have a brother-in-law that uh, I wrote a book on. My, my brother-in-law was shot down in France in 1944. He was declared dead. He was buried in a village in, north, in, the, in the north of Paris. I visited his grave. In fact, I wrote his book. I wrote the book. Fifty years later, they found him alive and well here in El Paso. That effect of my, my brother-in-law and my two brothers kind of led me to say, well, it's my turn to serve. And when the Korean War started, I immediately, my friends and I talked about it, and, uh, and I immediately went in. And it affected my career in terms of discipline, I think, in terms of, because I, I, I became a, a corporal or a PFC first and then a, right, almost right away unlike all the other friends that were with me. Uh, I don't know why, maybe the discipline that I had in school, in high school, uh, maybe the discipline that my, my family instilled in me and my brothers, you know, my brothers came back. And, and when I joined, my four years of service were a trained in, uh, a training period for me, and a good one. And, uh, and the discipline that I acquired, I applied it to my, to my business and I was very successful in my business. When I sold it, I sold it for a good amount of dollars in terms of uh, what I had done in the past uh, uh, 28 years. So um, I would say that my service career uh, helped me in, in the, my future endeavors up to, up to now because I'm a member of uh, two military organizations. I still do a lot of work for temp in, uh, in, a, in a voluntary basis, of course. I do a lot of work for uh, the uh, servicemen. Uh, we help service through the organization of the Veterans Business Association. We help all those young kids that are going out of the service that want to go into business for themselves. They want to, uh, they want to uh, review their resume because you know military careers, as compared to civilian careers, the resumes don't don't usually jive. So we help them. Uh, we help the homeless veterans. Uh, so I'm still helping in terms of the military. I'm still helping, be, and and I think it was influenced by um, by what I did in the service. So uh, yes, it uh, it has helped me, and not only in, uh, in through my service career, but in my business career. So, is there any message that you would leave for future generations? I think that uh, I think that one of the messages that I would leave to the new generation, since there is no draft now and I see it all the time with these youngsters that are in the service. Uh, I, I, I have a program that I talk to the kids in school about uh, the double D theory, discipline and determination. And to me, the service career, a service career, whether it's two years or four years or whatever, gives you that discipline and determination. Uh, it did to me. So consequently, you learn discipline in the service and, and and you and, and you have the, uh, the 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 want to to continue that. So the double D theory, discipline, and determination is a uh, is a good theory. And and I and I talk to high school kids about that, you know. So uh, I, I think that uh, I would tell all the youngsters if there's a chance for you to spend two years in the service, even in the reserve, even in the whatever service uh, agency is involved. It'll good for you. It's 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 good for your future career. And being young, you still have uh, many years ahead of you. So consequently, I would uh, I would certainly recommend it. And I talked to them. Uh, in in fact, um, what is it? The twenty first, uh, which is I think Friday or something. I'll be talking to a high school class in uh, here in El Paso. Not about necessarily about my service career, which I do talk about my career in, in the service and uh, in, in my Korean because as a Korean war veteran. Um, but I talk to them about their future. And surprisingly, they listen. The kids listen. Some of the kids, uh, one of the little, uh, little girls, because uh, uh, a lot of these kids that I talk to are 12 years old, 10 years old. And one uh, I was talking about, you know, the uh, the government of Korea gave us a certificate, real beautiful uh, medallion certificate, and I take it with me and I show it to another kid. And one of the little girls says, "Are you a hero?" 
I said, no, 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 I'm not a hero. I just spend my time there like everybody else. And we interview uh, the guys uh, in our organization because a lot of these guys want to uh, go into business for themselves, for example. And me as, a, as an ex-businessman, I, I tell them the, the discipline that they need to go into business. I tell them the, uh, the steps they should take to go into business for themselves, how to model their business in terms of competition, all that. We tell them all that. And then we review the resume, and uh, a lot of these kids have a tremendous education in terms of military stuff, logistics and all that. But they can't, uh, they, they can't put it in civilian terms. So we help them with that, and hopefully it'll help to, for their future. And sometimes so they want to go into business for themselves, we guide them to where the other agencies are that uh, uh, might loan them some money, SBA, or how to apply for in the banks and stuff like that. In the other organization, the homeless, we actually uh, try to get homeless people to, uh, we take them to two homeless centers. Uh, there's. Uh, Two centers up here that uh, that we use uh, if he's homeless, so they can go out there and spend a few days. But surprisingly enough, and this is rather unusual, some of these kids uh, or these homeless don't want help. I don't know why. We offer them help. We offer them to take them and give them new clean clothing and stuff. But some of them don't want. It. Why I don't know. Maybe they're a little bit off or something. But um, that's what we do. Well, that's what I do in, uh, in terms of now being retired. And of course, it messes up with my golf sometimes. And, uh, but I don't, I don't mind it. I enjoy it. <laughs>